Our scripture reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. This can be found in the New Testament section of the Pew Bible on page 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Do you know what you spend your money on? I recently read the results of a survey conducted by one poll about Americans and their discretionary spending habits. The survey included 2,000 people, and it revealed that Americans, on average, spend $18,000 on non-essential items per year. Now, the article I was reading then went on to name what the top 10 things are that Americans buy with that money. And the first four had to do with food and with drink. Each month, we spend an average of $209 on eating dinner in restaurants. Okay. $173 on buying lunch out. $177 on takeout or delivery. $189 on cocktails and $20 on coffee. Other things on the list included streaming services, cable, paid apps, subscription boxes, ride share, and impulse purchases. But let's go back to that food and drink for just a minute. When you add all of that up, that's $768 per month on restaurant food, alcohol, and coffee. There's an old adage that says, if you want to learn what is important to a person, look at their checkbook. I guess nowadays we'd probably say, look at their online transaction history. But if that's true, we can tell that Americans very much value their food and drink. We're now deep into our annual giving campaign with the theme of, I dream of a church. God has given us this church to care for as God's stewards. So I've been encouraging you during this time to dream about what will be happening in this church in 5, 10, or 50 years. How will our church serve our children and our children's children, our community, our country, our world? What do we need to do today to create that church? And of course, how much of yourself, your time, your talents, and of course your money, are you willing to invest in those dreams? Last week we talked about trusting God and dreaming of a church which will continue to be a voice of love and justice in our country and in our world. Today I'd like to explore what it looks like if we align our spending with our values, both in the church and in our individual lives. This, of course, isn't a new idea. It's exactly what Jesus is addressing in our scripture reading from Matthew. The context of this passage about treasure is the Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, in which he is teaching people a, a new set of priorities for life, a new way of living that focuses on love and justice and goodness. What Jesus is saying is that the treasures we have here on earth the material objects we collect, the takeout meals, the streaming services, all of those things don't have eternal meaning. They're just things, and many of them will be gone within an hour or eventually break and be thrown out because we no longer want or need them. Jesus contrasts those earthly treasures with the treasures we store in heaven. Those are the treasures we accumulate when we live according to our faith. 
They are values and beliefs that have eternal meaning and eternal impact. Faith, hope, love, compassion, acts of kindness, goodness, service, and generosity. And all of these are fostered in the church because God's purpose for the church is that we can join God in building the kingdom of God. In church, we hear again and again the great promises of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. We meet others who are striving to live the Jesus way and learn from them. We have opportunities to serve the very people that Jesus called us to serve, the poor, the marginalized, the immigrants and refugees, the hungry and thirsty, the unhoused. And in church, we find hope, even when disaster strikes or we feel threatened. If we believe that what we spend our money on reveals what we value, then I think it's important to periodically do an inventory of our spending, which is something we're going to do as a congregation in January. Earlier this year, I was introduced to the concept of participatory budgeting by a small group of our congregation who felt we should try it here. Basically, participatory budgeting is a way to involve more people in considering how our money is spent. In the past, our budgeting process has been led by our wonderful finance committee. They gather input from staff, the administrative and program committees, about how much they anticipate spending in the year. They compare those requests with the amount that people have pledged to give and then propose a budget to the Leadership Council. Participatory budgeting invites you to give input that might shape our budget for the coming year or the next several years. We'll have an event after worship on January 26th when you'll have an opportunity to suggest what we should prioritize in our spending based on our values and vision for our church. This is why particip the participatory budgeting team asked me to outline the principles and values that we hold as a congregation. And I included things like being welcoming and inclusive, faith formation and growing as disciples, social justice, serving our community, sustainability, and generosity. Before our participatory budgeting event, you'll have an opportunity to make propo proposals for where our money should go in the future. Perhaps you think we should pay off our mortgage early or put more money towards contemporary worship. You can make a proposal with a rationale to be considered by the group that day. You'll also have a chance to see what we are spending on our money on now and consider, does it reflect our values? Does it align with the teachings of Jesus Christ? Does it help sustain us into the future? I also think that this is something you can do with your household budget. If you look at your spending, what does it say about your heart? Does your spending align with your values? Are your values aligned with God's values? How does giving to church fit into that? Is there something you might change to bring your spending to a place where it reflects what's truly important to you? These are questions to prayerfully consider as you think about your pledge to the church for next year. Is there something that you would change in order to be able to give a little bit back to God? Because ultimately, stewardship isn't only about raising money for the church budget. In fact, as a Christian practice, the fundraising aspect of stewardship really is secondary. This scripture passage that we look at today invites us to look at our spending and our giving now, today. But notice the second part of the verse is in the future tense. There your heart will be also. Stewardship, 
giving generously, is meant to be transformative of the heart. In his book, Practicing Extravagant Generosity, Robert Schneezy explores the difference between stewardship and generosity. Stewardship is our call from God to care for God's church, God's children, and God's creation. Generosity, he writes, is an aspect of a person's character. I admire and respect generous people, and I want to become like them. But you don't acquire this attribute of generosity apart from the actual practice of giving. We recognize generosity in others from their actions. They are people who are generous with their time, their teaching, their love, and their money. Schneezy goes on to point out that generosity is learned and takes practice. Sometimes we have to do the generous thing, and the transformation of our hearts follows. By giving, Schneezy continues, we develop the inner qualities of a generous person. God uses our practice of generosity to reconfigure our interior life. By giving, we craft an inner desire that becomes the driving element of life, and our motivations change. Maybe you've had the experience of going on a mission trip or, or spending a day do, at a, working in a food pantry, and when it's over, you, you go home and you talk with your partner or a friend, and they ask you, how was it? Do you feel like you made a difference? And your immediate answer is yes, or maybe, to some extent, and then you reflect for a minute and you say, actually, I think they gave more to me than I gave to them. That experience has changed your heart. You will be a kinder, more generous, less judgmental person because of the time you spent giving to someone else. So God transforms our hearts through generosity in other ways as well. For example, when we step back to do an inventory of our spending, we recognize how much God has given us, how very blessed we are, and that leads to a deep sense of gratitude. We realize again that everything we have is a gift of God's creation. So out of our gratitude, we choose to give a portion back to God. Finally, I think generosity in general, and specifically generosity to the church, is an investment in hope. Giving brings out the best of us, and at this particular moment of time, we need to be the best of who we can be, and we need to witness and encourage the generosity and goodness of others. The church is the only long-standing institution that exists for the purpose of transforming hearts, transforming lives, and transforming the world. Like last week, I have a little gift for you to take home. You can pick up as you leave the sanctuary today. At the exit doors, you will find little hearts carved of stone. I invite you to pick out your favorite one and take it home with you. Hold it on, in your hand as you reflect on what really matters the most to you. Put it in places in your home that somehow represent your core priorities. Pray with it as you consider how much of God's gifts you will give back to the church. Keep it in a pocket to remind you that where your treasure is, your heart will be also. May it be so. Amen.